Dr. Vincent Baker, the director of the Wheaton College Center for Applied Christian Ethics. And uh, the reason that, that we're having this conversation today is basically because, uh, in part, our theme this year is about being uh, countercultural, being anti, but not, not being anti cultural. Um, and, uh, and part of that is having conversations about important things and perhaps conversations that we haven't had very much here at Wheaton College and trying to uh, model a way of engaging difficult conversations or difficult topics or controversial topics, um, in, I think in a, a way that is constructive and informative. And uh, this was particularly catalyzed, uh, David Iglesias uh, gave some public comments about a Christian response to torture. It occurred to me that we haven't really had a conversation about a response to terror. We haven't really had a conversation uh, certainly about torture here uh, on this campus. So, uh, after some conversation with uh, my colleagues in political science, uh, we put this together this afternoon. So, uh, I'm, I'm very thrilled that uh, my colleague Dr. Brian McGraw has agreed uh, to, to moderate this. And I'll hand it off to him to introduce uh, our two guests and we'll look for a very interesting conversation together. Brian. Um, my name is uh, Professor Brian McGraw. I teach political theory over in the uh, politics and IR department. And um, uh, let me just briefly uh, give you a sense of what we're going to do today and, uh, and then introduce our guests. Uh, we're going to spend probably 20, 25 minutes. I have some questions I'm going to sort of pitch to them about the American response to terrorism, particularly since 9-11. Um, and then we'll open it up for your questions and, and, and concerns. And we really want to make this a kind of conversation. It's not a, a series of one-off lectures and, uh, or one-off sort of monologues and whatnot. Um, uh, here is a Professor uh, uh, Iglesias, David Iglesias, uh, who is the director of the Hastert Center. Uh, this is in, you're still in your first year, right? Yeah. Uh, well, and uh, we're glad he's here. Uh, he served at uh, state, local, and federal levels as a federal <laughs> prosecutor. Uh, he served at Gitmo. He's a retired Navy captain. Um, and uh, he is, uh, we're, just, we're just thrilled that he's here and uh, hopefully he'll sort of be able to shed some light on, well, a lot of the issues around uh, those, those kinds of topics. Uh, Professor Will Inboden. Um, we'll be giving tonight at uh, 7 o'clock in this same place uh, where you should return and listen to his lecture on uh, conflicts in the Middle East and American foreign policy therein. That's going to um, be too much in Bowdoin in one day, right? So don't, no, yeah, okay, it's so. a lot. Not, not, <laughs> no such thing. No such thing. Uh, he's the executive director of the uh, William P. Clements Center for Strategy, a history, strategy, and statecraft at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he's an associate professor in the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Um, in uh, past lives, uh, he has uh, worked on the policy planning staff at the Department of State and in the National Security Council, has extensive policy experience, um, in particular sort of in dealing with strategy, uh, national security strategy, and so on. Um, so let me get things going, and this is for uh, Professor uh, Inboden, if you would sort of, wouldn't mind sort of starting off. If you were to kind of be able to sort of characterize kind of American strategy vis-a-vis -vis terrorism, Right, uh, particularly since 9 11, right? I mean, there were terrorism attacks before that, but particularly since 9 11. What would you, how would you characterize it? Like, what, what were the big um, components of American strategy uh, since then? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks, thanks so much for having me here, Brian. Uh, it's especially an honor to be here with uh, Professor Iglesias. Uh, I know he's a relative newcomer to Wheaton in this phase of running the, the Hastert Center, but uh, as someone who was in Washington for a long time, let me say that he looms very large in the national security community and is a great get for Wheaton. So um, please exploit him. Please, uh, <laughs> I mean that in the Christian sense of exploitation. Of course, uh, uh, but to have uh, someone of his uh, Practitioner's experience, uh, you know, real world practice here on campus is an invaluable resource. So I hope all of you have a chance to get to know him, take his classes, and take Professor McGraw's classes too, of course. Anyway, as, as the outsider, I can, I can say this. So um, to, to rewind for, for a little bit, um, I was in Washington, D.C. on 9 11. I was in the process of joining the Bush administration. I was not yet in government, but I was uh, very close to the Pentagon when it was hit and then was a few blocks from the White House when uh, Todd <coughs> Beamer, among others, uh, and his act of heroism, you know, prevented the fourth plane from, from hitting Washington. And 
it may seem, I know to this generation of students, like that's more and more the distant past, but for those of us who lived through it, it was a very searing experience. You know, everyone remembers where they were on that day, even if you weren't in New York or, or, or Washington, but especially for those of us who are in one of the two cities that were hit. And as I look back now, almost 14 years later, uh, reflecting on my several years in the Bush administration where I was uh, one of the people involved in some of the higher level strategies we were, we were trying to do, it's interesting to think about um, what we got right, in my estimation, what we got wrong, in my estimation, what strategic principles have endured, um, what ones have been chucked by the wayside because they were either immoral or not working. And I know we'll be talking about a lot of that today. So thinking about what is the um, you know, American stra uh, strategy towards counterterrorism today, well, first I'll say this, that if you would have told any of us who are in Washington or New York, for that matter, on September 12th, the day after that, almost 14 years later, we'd be sitting here and the United States would not have been hit again on a large scale. I know there's been a couple of these lone wolf attacks, the Boston bombers, Major um, uh, Nidal Hassan at Fort Hood, things like that, but we haven't been hit on a large scale again. We all would have been dumbfounded. Um, in the weeks and months after 9-11, the question was not, if they'll hit us again, it was when and where are they going to hit us again. Uh, and that was, that was the mentality of the time. That This is not to justify some of the strategic and moral errors I think were made, um, but just to give you a sense of uh, even you know, what everyone on up to, to President Bush thought. We were all just on edge waiting for that. And strategy and policy was devised in that window, in that crucible. Uh, you know, the, the president and his national security team didn't have the luxury of I'm sitting in graduate school seminars or conference rooms for months on end uh, debating these things. They had to be coming up with this on, on the fly. And looking back, uh, the Bush administration settled on a few principles early on that with some modification, I think arguably the Obama administration is still following, still following today. They may put some different rhetorical coats on them, um, but one uh, would be preemptive action. This is often associated with the Iraq War. Uh, the correct term there was really preventive if we want to get into just, just war theory. But by this I mean uh, trying to take action against terrorist threats or perceived terrorist threats. I'm trying to put this in neutral ways, okay? We can talk about the normative, uh, the right and wrong, and the strategically and morally. I'm happy to have that. But just in terms of describing what the, what the doctrines are. Uh, taking action against the uh, terrorist threat before, the perceived terrorist threat before it, before it hits us. Um, and the uh, Bush administration did this in a number of ways, but this is really what the Obama administration is doing with the drone campaign. Um, you know, by and large, the vast majority of the drone strikes, which are taken out, uh, you know, legitimate or illegitimate targets, we can, we can talk about that. These are not people who are about to pull the trigger. Uh, they're ones perhaps planning, uh, they're ones perhaps with uh, malicious intent, but these are preemptive actions that uh, we, are, we are taking uh, against, uh, you know, terrorist threats before they, before they hit us. Um, there's a certain history of this in the laws of war, but it's also contested, uh, and I think something needs to be debated more. Uh, the Obama administration, uh, you know, criticized a lot of this during the campaign, but then adopted a lot of it once they once they came in, came into office. Um, uh, another, another principle is uh, that, that Bush developed, and I think the Obama people have, have largely followed, is not distinguishing uh, between the terrorists themselves and then the, the countries that harbor them. Uh, now this can be whether it's a malevolent uh, regime, uh, you know, such, as, uh, such as Iran or, uh, or Afghanistan under the Taliban. Uh, or it can also be uh, poorly governed states such as Yemen or Somalia, where a lot of this activity is, is, is taking place. Um, but uh, essentially the doctrine is uh, if there are uh, you know, perceived terrorists in this territory, then we are going to treat that entire territory as more or less uh, uh, hostile. doesn't mean the government itself is always going to be at, at fault, but they'll at least be uh, treated as not able to govern, govern, their, govern their own space. Um, Another one, uh, and this I think gets on the legal dimensions, which I'll want to hear from, uh, I think we'll all want to hear from David on, but also some of the moral ones, is uh, most American actions are still by and large unilateral. Uh, a lot of these do not have UN authorization, uh, international law. My take on this as a historian and not a lawyer is somewhat murky here. Um, 
you know, the Bush administration did a lot of chest thumping about unilateralism. The Obama administration pretends not to mention the word, but acts that same way. Uh, you know, particularly again with the uh, the drone strikes in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, Somalia. These are not done under UN sanction. They're not done as part of a part of a big big coalition. This United States acting as the United States, uh, and even the congressional authorities, I think, for this are somewhat dubious. I mean. I want to hear your take, David. I think the 2001 AMF has been stretched beyond all recognition. I think we should probably get another one. But I'm the non-lawyer, so I'm, I'm practicing law without a license up here. Um, uh, yeah, but um, so preemption, unilateralism, uh, and, and doing this um, without a clear mandate in international law. But perhaps there is a case that this is being done morally still. I think there actually can be a case that some of these actions are, are moral. They're in some difficult gray areas. This is where morality and the law do not always align perfectly. Uh, I wish they did. That's one of the, any of you going into international law, I'd like to see more alignment between, uh, between uh, morality, morality and the law. So um, I've been riffing enough. Uh, so this question for, for David actually sort of. So in terms of legal strategy, right, I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a raft of new or, or at least sort of uh, newly vivid uh, legal questions that come up uh, with the, sort of the American response to 9-11. Um, how would you evaluate sort of American legal strategy uh, since 9-11? Since I mean, are there things that we've done well, mm -hmm. um, uh, things that we've done really poorly? Uh, I mean, what, what, how, how would you evaluate some of this? Thing? Yeah, I, I was... Uh, Really struck by your your comment, Will, about 12 years ago, no one would have thought we wouldn't have been hit in a major way. Uh, I'll never forget a call from the former Deputy Attorney General during the election of 2004. That's Jim Comey, who's now the FBI Director, and he had all the United States attorneys on the phone. He said, "Ladies and gentlemen, our evidence is that we're going to be hit big in the next few weeks, and your job is to shake every tree." and prevent that second large attack from happening. And I remember the hair on the back of my neck, it's, it's standing up now, but it was doing that at that time, thinking, oh no, we've got another 9-11. And we didn't, and, and, and we haven't. So I, I think, you know, to a large degree, we've been successful in dismantling Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda cannot mount the type of catastrophic attack that it did in September of 2001. It still exists, but it's been largely uh, defanged. Uh, getting back to your question, Will, about the AUMF of 2001, uh, if you look at the language, and my, my class just studied this, it's directed toward the organizations, including Al-Qaeda, that were responsible for 9-11. Okay. So Al-Qaeda, as I just sta stated, is largely defanged, uh, deconstructed. Uh, so to the extent that, that that AUMF is still in place, it's very tenuous that we can mount anything else, and which is why the Obama administration has proposed a new AUMF of 2015, which would cover other, other types of counterterrorist activity. So legally, uh, our response was primarily military, uh, and we used our armed forces to uh, retake Afghanistan, which had been a haven for Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, so we did a good job there. We've largely dismantled Al-Qaeda. Al That's good. We made some mistakes along the way. Uh, certainly our interrogation uh, practices uh, fell way short of, of what we stand for as a country, and in my view as a lawyer, violated the uh, several international treaties that we signed as a country. Uh, so we did make some mistakes. Now one thing that I hope the audience understands is uh, Will was operating from a, a policy-making level in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, whereas I was operating as, a, as an operator, so to speak, as a United States attorney who actually implemented policy. So my, my job was to keep a close look on the southwest border, make sure we had no Al-Qaeda operatives uh, sneaking across the border with illegal immigrants. So that, that was my contribution. And then as a Navy JAG reservist, it was to uh, support the military any way possible. And, uh, in taking the fight to the enemy overseas, not letting them come back to the U.S., but taking that fight overseas to our enemies. Um, so, we sort of, sort of uh, uh, ask you sort of a follow-on question to that. Um, if you had been sort of in the White House and been asked sort of uh, for legal advice on what to do with uh, uh, what to do with 
um, the people who ended up in Guantanamo Bay, for instance, sort of detainees, right? People who are uh, very plausibly, indeed, probably quite, you know, they're on the bad side of things, uh, but they're not regular soldiers. They don't quite fit into any kind of nice, neat legal categories. Um, what would you have recommended uh, the administration? Because you're, you're sort of on record as suggesting that, you know, the administration you know, made, made serious, significant mistakes, and legal mistakes. Right. Um, what, would, what would you have suggested? Well, uh, you know, uh, common Article Three of the Geneva Convention makes clear that even sub-state actors such as terrorists are uh, required to be treated humanely. Uh, and that's what we did not do for a number of years until, for instance, Senator John McCain introduced a Detainee Treatment Act. We had a hard time figuring out what to do with these guys uh, because they were clearly not uh, members of a, of a nation state, uh, such as a foreign soldier, such as a German soldier or a <coughs> Japanese soldier during World War II that typically obeyed the laws of war. So, but, uh, and the, the, the administration had legal cover from the John Woo memo of uh, January of 2002 and the Jay Bybee memo of August of 2002 in which they basically said, you know, we can treat these folks in any way we want provided there's no uh, organ failure or imminent death, which means pretty much anything is, is permissible. And if you know anything about how the Justice uh, uh, DOJ works is when the Office of uh, Legal Counsel issues an opinion, it's binding on the executive branch. So it's, it's a powerful piece. So our agencies had the ability legally for, for just a, a few years to use, uh, you know, um, in my view, conduct that violated the Convention Against Torture, Common Article Three, and the War Crimes Act, uh, which became federal legislation in the 1980s. Uh, to answer your question directly, uh, we, should not, we should have treated them as, as normal combatants. Uh, I'm not as bothered with the location of Guantanamo, because we needed a place that was close to the United States. Uh, leaving them overseas, I think, would have been problematic. Bringing them into the United States would have been problematic, too, because then they, they would have lawyered up, and then we would have had to have uh, used um, the Justice Department to prosecute them as common criminals. And I'm willing to concede that you can't treat uh, a, uh, a terrorist like a common criminal, but they still, still maintain residual uh, rights to be treated humanely. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the mistake we made was, was not just putting them in Guantanamo, I, I'm okay with that, but uh, allowing them to be maltreated. Uh, that, that created a whole set of other legal and moral problems. If I can jump in on this here, uh, because embedded in David's remarks, there was a really important strategic principle I forgot to mention earlier, which is that the Bush administration decided that this is a war. And that's not just rhetoric to get the American people fired up and join, you know, address the joint session of Congress. Or there, there's a whole set of uh, legal and moral uh, and tactical and strategic implications that go along with that. And the Obama administration, again, has <coughs> largely, as a matter of doctrine, continued treating this as a war. That's why they're asking for a new authorization to use military force against the Islamic State, uh, things like that. And this, again, may seem self-evident and common, common sense. Uh, the Americans, you know, well, look, they killed 3,000 of us on 9-11. If that's not an act of war, I don't know. I don't know what is. That's, you know, a thousand more people than were killed at Pearl, Pearl Harbor. But uh, not to get into too much of the, of the 90s, but there is a case to be made. I, I don't buy it, but there is a case to be made that terrorism is more of a law enforcement le legal problem. Now, it, in truth, <coughs> it's, it's everything. It's an intelligence problem. It's uh, a political development problem. It's a law enforcement legal problem. And it's a war. And it's a military challenge. And that's why perhaps the best analogy to the struggle, the conflict we're in right now is really to the Cold War, where you're going to have some localized kinetic manifestations of, of hot war, as we did with uh, Afghanistan, arguably Iraq. Um, but also there's the ideological challenge of how do you change people's mind not to follow this, this uh, poisonous totalitarian ideology, whether it's communism or, or militant jihadism. Um, and then there's the legal matter of how do you preserve uh, civil liberties for under our constitution for Americans at home? And then how do you, uh, how do you preserve and protect the civil liberties that other people have through their innate dignity as being human beings, uh, even if they're not Americans and bad actors, or or that are protected on inter, inter, international law, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and things like this. And so, 
In deciding that this uh, conflict was largely a war, as the Bush administration did and the Obama administration did, even though a lot of things followed, that doesn't mean that it's only war. That doesn't mean that the only instruments in it are, uh, you know, the SEALs that took out bin Laden or uh, any number of, uh, you know, four deployed military units. But rather, you need to have the intelligence professionals and the lawyers and the, you know, the USAID people out there too. So, um, so what? Why don't we take questions from you all? I have some other questions in case there's quiet or, or silence or, or whatever, but uh, I'd be interested in hear what our audience uh, might have. No doubt you came um, with questions in your head or in your pocket and things that you would like uh, to have answered uh, from from either one of our guests. Right, and I'll, I'll try to restate the questions because I have a somewhat loud voice. Uh, um. This is to Captain Iglesias. You mentioned that you weren't concerned about the location of Guantanamo because there's an issue of bringing them into the states. Uh, what are the ramifications of the fact that US, our U.S. military base is considered American territory? And what are the legal ramifications of that if they are? Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, so how, how do we treat Guantanamo? Because it, it's, it's technically part of Cuba. Uh, Cuba still owns it, but it's under United States jurisdiction. So there's no concurrent jurisdiction with Cuba. Uh, well, the, the base of Guantanamo has been around since 1902. It's our oldest overseas base. We've used it for a variety of things. And most recently, we've used it uh, to hold these detainees. Uh, I think it's the appropriate place because I view the attacks on 9-11 as more of an act of war than a gigantic crime scene. I mean, you could make a case that the Justice Department should have prosecuted the attack on New York. I think the better response is it's really a military action. It needs to be treated as this country has treated other military war crimes with the military commissions. So I, I, I was uh, supportive of the Bush administration <coughs> saying we need to treat these as war crimes. We need to treat them as war criminals, not common crimes. Therefore, really, uh, any location overseas would have been an appropriate venue. I mean, we could have set up a uh, a war crime uh, tribunal in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, and that, 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 that would have been okay. But I, I think the location of Guantanamo is good because that allowed uh, other agencies to come down and question them. Now, the manner in which they were questioned was problematic uh, for, for a period of, of a few years. But to me, and I understand former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld called Guantanamo the least worst place. I, I understand why he says that. But I do some, see some advantages of, of having the commissions there versus the mainland or overseas. And I don't know if my colleague here thinks differently. Yeah, and as a non-lawyer, I defer to that very good that bit of legal reasoning you just heard there. So, no, it, uh, it, yeah, again, uh, it, it, it seems to make sense because if, if this was an act of war, if it was a, uh, you know, a military attack on us, which I, I think it was, even though it wasn't by troops from a recognized nation state because they weren't wearing insignia because they, uh, uh, you know, didn't follow the usual model of, say, when, you know, when Japan attacked us at, at Pearl Harbor. Although, remember, I mean, maybe it passes the common sense test. Bin Laden declared war in the United States. His 1996 fatwa declared war in the United States. And so raises an interesting existential question. Um, you know, are, are we at war with them if they say they're, they're at war with us? Um, and I, I, think, I think so. In retrospect, do you think it would have been better for Bush to have asked for a formal declaration of war? against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? Um, I'll give a policy-ish answer, and then I'll uh, defer to David on the, on the legal answer. Uh, I don't think so. My sense from talking to my lawyer friends is that formal declarations of war are somewhat obsolete. We haven't had one since we declared war on, uh, on Germany on, what was that, December 11th, uh, 1946? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the 8th. Uh, yeah, well, the 8th was Japan, but then Germany declared war on us on the 11th, and then we didn't declare war on them until then. So that was, I think, the declaration of war in Nazi Germany five days after Pearl Harbor, four or five days, was the last declaration of war. Because uh, then once the UN Charter was adopted with an um, uh, you know, inherent right of, of, of self-defense, no longer were formal declaration of wars needed because that's now recognized under UN law. So that's why we get from Congress authorizations to use uh, military force. It's, um, my sense as the non-lawyer, but from looking at this history, historically. Uh, I, now, as a policy, a political matter, I think uh, Bush was absolutely right to go to Congress and 
asked for an authorization. He did this, for whatever else you may think about the Bush administration, it was notable that they went to Congress and asked for authorization in 2001 to attack Afghanistan uh, and associate elements of Al-Qaeda, and then in 2002 to attack Iraq a few, a few months later. Uh, I say that because the Obama administration did not do that. Um, they never even got congressional authorization to attack Libya. And uh, I think as a policy matter, it's just wise. It's more, it will do more to unite the country if the people's representatives in the legislature are able to do a formal vote saying that we support this use of, of military force, which is, I think, a, a de facto uh, declaration, of, uh, declaration of war. So. Yeah, and to answer that question, I don't think it would have made any difference. Um, w whether you call it an AUMF, an authorization for use of military force, or declare war. Uh, and, but I do think that, that the executive, the, the president, does need to get authorization from Congress. I mean, there, there is the, the War Powers Act, which Congress passed. It's never been fully challenged. Um, so no one is really sure if it's fully in effect. Is, is the president really required <coughs> to get authorization? The answer is probably yes, but the Supreme Court has never heard that specific issue, so, so no one really knows. But I think the more politi politic thing to do uh, for a president who relies on funding by, by, by the Congress is to get some level of authority. Uh, but in terms of did the AMF result in fewer bombs and, and fewer tanks and fewer ships being deployed? No. So no, no difference in our offensive military capability. Well, I, I'm just going to add to this, and I don't want to dominate this at all, but having spoken to a number of the attorneys who were down at Gitmo representing the detainees, their argument is that he should have asked for a declaration of war because it would have made it more difficult for them to have access to the detainees, and many of them shut up after they, they met with the lawyers. Prior to that, we were getting more information than we got after the lawyers came in. And they thought that a lack of a formal declaration of war was something that worked to their advantage. So uh, that, that's interesting. I, I know quite a few uh, JAGs and, and civilian lawyers who have represented uh, detainees. <coughs> I've not heard that. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, but you know, having been a defense counsel myself, would that would that have helped my cause? Uh, I'll, I'll have to say, reasonable minds differ on that. I, I'm not sure. I'm I'm not persuaded by that. Our country is a country that prides itself on the high moral ground and are, in a sense, our uh, moral superiority. Uh, a lot of that went down the tubes uh, after 9-11. And I'm wondering why you think that this, these moral lapses occurred with the treatment of prisoners and torture? Uh, and uh, or was it just simply anger and retribution? And what safeguards are there or should there be in the future to avoid this kind of problem of outrage and anger when we are attacked uh, by some other force or country in the future? I can, I can take a crack at it first. So, I mean, one of the things that you don't hear people talk about much is in the fall of 2001, there was a lot of fear in Washington. I mean, I, I remember meeting with John Ashcroft in his, in his office and wondering, could Al-Qaeda build a bomb big enough to take out the fifth floor where, where his office was? Uh, I remember seeing the Jersey barriers. I remember seeing sandbags. I mean, it was, it was a militarized city. And which, we had anthrax and the D.C. sniper, too. That's right. Crazy. That's right. Did, sorry. So, yeah. uh, which I completely forgot about. But, uh, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. So there's a lot of fear there. I think people act in a defensive posture. Uh, anytime there's fear, uh, there, there was a lot of anger. Uh, but I, I think our, our tendency of being a law of or a nation of laws and not men in this sense hurt us because we, we had a notional uh, memos that from Bybee and, and Wu and, uh, and you rather at the Justice Departments which gave us legal cover. They were uh, initially, they were eventually withdrawn as being uh, ill-founded. But I, I don't, you know, I am critical of our response <coughs> until we turned it around, until we fixed the commissions to give more greater due process rights for the detainees, until the, the Detainee Treatment Act uh, was passed. So we, we did make a mistake for a number of years, but I don't think you can argue any time after about 2007 did we, as a nation, lose our moral standing. Uh, you know, Abu Ghraib was a terrible stain, but that was done by low-level soldiers. They were turned in by another soldier, investigated by the Army. Those soldiers were court-martialed, and they were punished. So it wasn't as if the actors 
acted with impunity. There were legal consequences for what they did. Uh, so one of the reasons I do like and love America is because we do have an ability to self-correct. We made terrible mistakes. We're not making those same mistakes now. I don't see us going back to that. I'll, I'll agree with uh, everything David said there. And I'll add a couple things too, which is, uh, you, know, you know, this is why discussions like this, when we're not under terrorist attack, uh, when we can talk about these um, rationally but, but sincerely, are important times to do a lot of our moral reasoning because when you are in the crucible, when, you know, you, you drive past the Pentagon a week after the attack and you still see black smoke coming out, uh, you know, when you had friends killed in this, it's easy to just be consumed with, uh, with, with anger and, and vindictiveness. And some of that is righteous, uh, but a lot of it is, is not, is probably more base. And so uh, to have a, both a legal structure and then a moral compass to restrain us from uh, lowering ourselves to the level of terrorists, I think is really important. By and large, I think our country did maintain that bearing with some of the exceptions that we've discussed. And it's also, I think, bears remembering you know, the, the things that didn't happen. After 9-11, there was a real fear at the White House that the American people would essentially go on pogroms against American Muslims. A few days after the attacks, Bush went down to the Grand Mosque on Massachusetts Avenue to show respect for the Islamic faith, to call on American. That's when the first time he said Islam is a religion of peace, which he was much criticized for, but to make clear to Americans this is not a war on Islam. You know, we all can give the talk on how the war on terror is a misnomer, terror is a tactic. And I mean, yes, we all agree. That came up, though, because the White House has been over backwards to make clear Islam is not the enemy. It's this, this one particular group of terrorists acting in the, in the name, name of Islam. Uh, and uh, American Muslims are still, you know, by and large, uh, you know, fully respected, fully integrated members of American society. Last year in the United States, there were twice as many hate crimes against Jews as there were against Muslims. This is not to downplay things like when that horrible killing happened in North Carolina a few weeks ago when that disgruntled atheist killed the three Muslims. I don't want to trivialize that at all. Yes, there have been some, some excesses, but I also think that uh, there are some ways the United States really did keep its moral bearing. Uh, remember that the enemy are you know, these Al-Qaeda jihadists and not uh, all of Islam, especially realizing eventually that some of the biggest victims of terrorism are their Muslims. I mean, you know, probably 10 times more Muslims have been killed by jihadist terrorists than non-Muslims, and our most important allies in the fight against the jihadists are non-jihadist Muslims, who are certainly the majority, majority of Muslims. Um, and so uh, that's, I think, a, a domain about the United States' uh, internal treatment of our, our Muslim citizens here, as well as our relations with other Muslim countries that we've more or less kept a pretty good bearing on, with, with some notable exceptions that we need to come clean about. But as David said, we have these self-correcting mechanisms as a, as a nation, of, nation of laws. Um, to what extent do you think Obama's um, dependence on drone strikes is an effort to avoid some of the legal problems with indefinite detention in Guantanamo Bay? And how would you justify um, legally or morally the drone strikes if we're saying that things got better after 2007? Um, are drone strikes okay from a legal, moral, and especially Christian perspective? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see uh, drone strikes as being any different than, uh, than the Allied uh, uh, bombing of uh, German and Japanese cities. I mean, it is a war. I don't see this as an extensive police action. It's a war. There was a declaration of war by, by Al-Qaeda twice uh, in the 1990s. Uh, you don't have to warn your, your enemies that you're going to bomb them. So I'm not bothered by a just war theory because they, they, there are groups out there that uh, not only hate Americas, uh, Americans and Israelis, they also hate uh, a lot of Muslims that they disagree with. So uh, I'm not sure I understand the, the rationale that uh, instead of uh, bombing them, we should uh, arrest them and then put them in Guantanamo. Um, you know, that's certainly an option that President Obama has. I don't criticize him for uh, using military means to a, a military problem. Now, I may have secondary law enforcement issues, uh, but that's one less combatant you have to worry about. Uh, so, yeah, now where, where it becomes troublesome to me, and that's why anytime there's a drone strike, there are, there are lawyers that vet that process. If there is a, a high possibility of collateral damage, which is, you know, code for killing non-combatants, then typically that drone strike is not going to happen. I mean, they, they really try to do as targeted of a strike as possible. 
Uh, and there have been some, some situations in which there have been a lot of non-combatants, typically family members and friends, near the target, and they've called it off. So it's not as if the Obama uh, strike team is just willy-nilly killing people uh, <coughs> without any rationale. I mean, I think that it's highly premeditated, and uh, I think there are enough safeguard bills in where it doesn't offend my notions of, of a just war. Yeah, I'll again largely agree with David there. I mean, because I do think this is a war because I do think drone, drone strikes are a legitimate act of essentially self, uh, anticipatory self-defense, uh, to use the, the technical term, against people who are actively plotting uh, uh, to, to kill Americans and, and our allies. But there is a, I, I do think we, there's two big areas we need to have a strategic debate in, in this country. Uh, one is the overall utility of these drone strikes. Uh, particularly, you know, the local resentments they, they, they inspire. Um, the possibility, look, not to be crude about it, but when you kill someone, you can't interrogate them. You can't get information from them. And there's some real trade-offs there. Yeah, we may have been, had the legal and moral right to kill that guy, plotting to kill America, uh, Americans, but we also missed the chance to glean uh, intelligence from him. Um, and so I think having a debate about some of the uh, uh, potential negative externalities, negative consequences of the, drain, uh, the drone strikes and lost intelligence, and also uh, damage, damage reputation to the United States. All that said, I mean, I've had that debate with friends and in my own head, and I'll still I'll come clean. I still support the drone strike campaign, I do, but I think that it's, um, I do wish that uh, we had a larger debate in the country, that Congress is more involved and had a more robust authorization of those, because they're still taking place under this 2001 law, which has, I think, been stretched too far. Another one that uh, hasn't come up yet, I think we need to have real debate on, is um, uh, uh, electronic surveillance and Edward Snowden. Um, I find it's always an interesting gut check question to ask people, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, uh, is Edward Snowden a traitor or a hero? Um, and I know it's real binary, and maybe he's a little bit of both. I happen to think he's a traitor, I'll come clean on that. But a lot of my students think he's a, think he's a hero. Um, and I think there's a generational divide on some of this. Some of them come down to how close were you to 9-11, how much does that shape your consciousness about the, um, you know, the civil, you know, civil liberties we're allowed to concede some, some territory on. But uh, Americans, we sometimes want to have it both ways. We want to be absolutely safe. We want to make sure our government does everything it can to make sure we don't have another 9-11 attack. And oh, by the way, we want to uh, be able to say and do uh, in anything uh, in, in complete privacy and not be subject to any of these sort of uh, uh, restrictions or curtailments. Um, of course, in truth, anyone who has a Facebook account or a Gmail account, you're giving up your private information all the time. You're just doing it to corporate America rather than to the NSA. Um, so, But I, I think we, uh, we need to have uh, a bigger debate in this country about those real, real trade-offs. Uh, that have been exacerbated by um, the Snowden stuff. Uh, because if we were to, s to suffer another large scale attack, and heaven forbid, I certainly hope it doesn't happen, I think you'll see public opinion shift sharply, uh, saying, why don't we do more? Why don't we detect this? Why, why wasn't uh, d more done and we'll have you know, congressional inquisitions and, and things like that? Whereas one of the luxuries of going 13 and a half, 14 years now since 9-11 since is it does breed a certain sense of maybe, maybe complacency. But here's the thing, uh, I don't want the United States to be a garrison state. I don't want us to be this large Leviathan national security state where we're constantly under siege, we're constantly looking where's the next terrorist can come. One of the blessings of being Americans is living in a relatively free and open society, uh, having you know the buffers of the two oceans and then uh, peaceful uh, relations with our neighbors to the north and south, and uh, not having to worry on a daily basis about, about being attacked. And so we want, you know, it's, we want to be able to go about our lives that way, but we also need to have a certain level of vigilance. It's, it's, it's almost, and there's trade-offs there. It's almost impossible balance to strike. Just as a follow-up, I'm going to give you three options. Uh, <coughs> hero, traitor, or something else. Okay? So hero, Snowden is, is a hero. You aren't, you aren't being graded for this. All right? uh, traitor. Okay? Good job. Right. Yes. Okay. Something else. So there's, there's, okay, so I, I think probably uh, that has the second, second highest number of votes. Uh, Snowden is quite problematic uh, because the federal prosecutor in me comes out and says, you know, <laughs> there's a right way of airing problems in a wrong way. And he, sure, he, he did discover a lot of abuses and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of government misconduct. But then so did Daniel Ellsberg during the Vietnam era. And Ellsberg, Ellsberg stuck around for his trial. He didn't abscond to Russia and make friends with uh, whoever was the premier of Russia at that time. Uh, he, he let the process, 
Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I was going to say Khrushchev, but I think he'd already died at yeah. <laughs> Brezhnev, thank you. Uh, they were all bad guys. It's yeah. all before your time. <laughs> trust me. So they made they made Putin seem like patty cakes. I mean, so. you know. But the point between uh, Ellsberg and Snowden is Ellsberg did it right. Uh, went through the process, was clear. Snowden did it the wrong way. So that that's what troubles me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what troubled me about Snowden. Is that he went to he went to our one of our adversaries, and he's turned over a lot of stuff. And he also was indiscriminate in what he turned over and revealed. There were some abuses going on. I mean, I I won't, I won't deny that at all. But there's a proper channel to, to to go through. We should have gone to Congress on that and have them vetted rather than turning over. Uh, look, there's a lot of bad guys out in the world who are using different systems now, who we are not monitoring like we used to be because of what he turned over. Uh, America is at a higher risk now of terrorist attack than we were, were before Snowden. That's just that's just a fact. Fortunately, we haven't suffered materially from it yet. Uh, so I, actually, this is a, uh, David, a question for you, also a clarification question. I, I've often wondered, what is the legal authority of these memos that, for instance, John Yu, and it, it seems like these are referenced as though they have independent legal weight. Are they a summary of existing law, or do they have actually an independent legal force within themselves? Yeah. Okay. So, so the question is, there, there are two, two, and these are commonly referred to as the DOJ, the Department of Justice Torture Memos. One came out in, in, uh, in early 02 and the other one in the summer of 02. Uh, one was uh, to the Secretary of Defense, Haynes. Uh, the other one was to my former boss, Alberto Gonzalez. So, so, the, so use memo, and remember he worked at the office. Who was White House counsel at the time? Right? Uh, well, Gonzalez, or? Gonzalez was the White House counsel, so yeah, he okay. was not the Attorney General okay. yet. So you was at Office of Legal Counsel, which again writes these binding opinions that binds the executive branch. A very powerful position, probably, arguably for a lawyer, the most powerful uh, place you can work in, on, on the executive branch. So y what you tried to figure out was how do we use abusive interrogation techniques my words, not his, uh, without running afoul of the, uh, of the War Crimes Act. Because if, if you literally read the War Crimes Act, which is essentially a federal codification uh, of the uh, Convention Against uh, Torture, any American, regardless of military, CIA, whatever, that does these is going to be subject to federal prosecution. So how do we insulate this? So you figures out a way. I disagree with his conclusion. But he figured out a way. Uh, Bybee writes a more extensive memo, uh, which goes to Alberto Gonzalez, in which he's defining torture. And you know, lawyers live in the definitions. We, we love the footnotes. We love to cite precedent. And, and Bybee puts out, in my view, this, this Byzantine, uh, Rube Goldberg-esque uh, legal justification, in which he says, OK, it's, it's OK to do these following things, which international law says we can't, as long as it doesn't lead to organ failure or death, we're OK. Well, that's all the legal justification that our, uh, our administration needed. So for a period of a few years, they're able to do that. And I, I tell my class, it's the ultimate stay out of jail card that you can have. So uh, CIA, military interrogators, law enforcement, they can do that. Now, I'm going to put in a plug for my friend Ali Sufan, who's coming next week. Because he was one of the first FBI agents to see what was going on and say, I'm not going to do that. Because we prosecute guys for doing what the CIA contractors uh, were doing right in front of my face. Uh, and he, he stepped out of it. And uh, you know history sided with Ali. Uh, and we went through a very dark period of time, in my view, uh, morally. Uh, did we get results? I think we can probably argue until the cows come home. Um, about that point. But I, I hope that answered your question. So, so I guess, it, it's, so the answer seems to be that those memos are, they're interpreting law. They're not making law. Because it almost sounds like their interpretation, because you said they're legally binding. So it's a they're, legally binding interpretation of the law? They're, they're giving opinions based on what the law is. Okay. But those opinions are binding on the executive branch. So it's almost like a Supreme Court decision, or like a court decision. It sounds like almost like Right, and it can only be overturned by the Justice Department? Or by a federal court, but they're no longer binding because they were withdrawn. Right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, um, I just know that ISIS is 
doing a lot of recruiting from the West. Do you know what our current policy is in America for American domestic citizens that are recruiting for ISIS, and what do you think on that about that policy? Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, great <coughs> question. The question is about um, ISIS, the Islamic State, uh, and its uh, efforts to recruit uh, uh, subjects and, and new participants in, in the West. So going back to when I started my remarks talking about right after 9-11, all of us expected we were going to get hit again, that we'd be very surprised to be here 14 years later not. I'll tell you another surprise, though, is that if you would have told us in Washington and government right after 9-11 that 14 years later that core Al-Qaeda would have been weakened like it was, but that meanwhile there would be a proliferation of jihadist franchises, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Shabaab, Al uh, Boko Haram, et cetera, et cetera, and this new, arguably even more nasty, more brutal, more horrific group called the Islamic State, which does set up a caliphate and controls a third of Iraq's territory and large swaths of Syria, and is attracting recruits from all over the world, a few thousand of whom have Western passports. Uh, if you would have told me that after 9-11, I'd say, ah, we're not in very good shape. Um, and so I do think we're in this new, very dangerous, very murky, very troublesome phase of this conflict, this, uh, this conflict, this, this, uh, this war, which is you know, still, still difficult, difficult to name. Uh, because there's a few unique attributes to the Islamic State that we haven't seen with these jihadist groups before. Um, one is the formal control of territory. Al-Qaeda never governed Afghanistan. The Taliban was governing Afghanistan, and, Tal and Al-Qaeda was there on you know, kind of really, really cheap rent, essentially. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship, but the Taliban was the formal authority. Uh, no longer, the Islamic State has formal control over those swaths of, uh, of uh, Iraq and Syria, and now arguably some pockets of Libya, too. So that's one, formal control of territory. Another is independent revenue sources. Uh, Al-Qaeda before was largely uh, relied on uh, financing from a few uh, radical sheikhs in some Gulf countries, giving its philanthropy and some of bin Laden's construction, uh, construction fortune. Uh, the Islamic State uh, is making a lot of money from selling oil on the black market, from ransoms, from, ki uh, from ki kidnappings, uh, and, and they, they're now becoming pretty, pretty wealthy. Uh, a third unique characteristic, they've actually formally set up a caliphate. Now that's a technical uh, aspect of Islamic history and law, but for propaganda purposes, it's very powerful. Because of bin Laden, for all of his chutzpah, the late bin Laden, he, never, he always wanted to set up a caliphate, he never actually did. And now the Islamic State has done that. And that is uh, repellent to most of the world's Muslims, and inspirational and attractive to a small but dangerous minority. Uh, and then finally, going back to your thing, a uh, unique attribute of the Islamic State is at least two or three thousand of them have European and American passports. Most Al-Qaeda guys did not have Western passports, and particularly with the permeable borders in the EU and visa waiver and things like this, this makes it a lot easier for them to uh, travel travel back, back and forth. Now we're trying to keep an eye on this. This is largely the domain of the FBI. Fortunately, FBI is cooperating a lot better with uh, the CIA um, ever since, you know, the Homeland Security and number of these uh, and the the Patriot Act and a lot of the post-9-11 post reforms, but it's worrisome. Um, one reason, uh, the one ideological advantage to all this is thus far the Islamic State seems mostly to be focused on the region itself. Al-Qaeda had the doctrine of attacking the far enemy. That's why they wanted to go after the U.S. Uh, rather than other countries in the region. The Islamic State seems more focused on the broader Middle East right now, but all it takes is a few of these guys going rogue or uh, reinterpreting some aspect of uh, jihadist ideology decide that they're going to use their Western passports and, and uh, to, to hit West, Western targets. So it's, it's very worrisome. I mean, uh, um, former acting CIA director John McLaughlin, we had him out to UT a few weeks ago, and uh, he said that he thinks we're now in the most uh, dangerous phase since, uh, since September 10th as far as N the number of uh, jihadist groups out there who have the capability and the means and the intent of hitting, hitting the U.S. So I didn't come here to scaremonger, uh, <laughs> but that's what uh, Director McLaughlin said. I don't know if you want to. The, the biggest weapon that the Justice Department has using law enforcement means is the material support of terrorism statute, which is incredibly broad. You send money. I mean, there, there's a, a, a local Chicago area woman who sent a few hundred dollars. I mean, that, that's a pittance. And well, she's, it's a lot of money if you're a college student, but okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, 50 pizzas, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she's, she was indicted recently for material support of terrorism. So you don't have to send thousands of dollars. You don't have to send, you know, expensive equipment. 
but you could provide a, a service uh, and virtually any amount of money and, and be uh, vulnerable to a federal prosecution. So that's a powerful tool that domestic law enforcement has to make sure that Americans uh, are not supporting foreign terrorists. Even if that terrorist group doesn't have an immediate threat to the United States, uh, the, the Justice Department has significant tools to, to uh, stamp out that uh, here, here in the U.S. Follow-up question. I know in Australia there's um, an individual who is advocating and uh, recruiting for ISIS, and they have them under house arrest. Um, if a U.S. citizen were simply to recruit and not to send money, does that? I mean, that's that's still, that's still providing a service, okay. and that 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 would not be uh, you know protected First Amendment speech. Do you know how broadly that is? I mean, just sharing a video that ISIS puts out include this? I mean, how how um, strictly? I, I would need that. more facts. If, if it's if he's if he's standing on a street corner saying uh, give money to ISIS, uh, depending on how sane he looked, uh, <laughs> he may or may not be vulnerable to prosecution. On the other hand, if he has a website set up uh, for, for people to give money, uh, he's he's going to get indicted. Yeah. Oh, hey Mark, just sort of a follow up to that. Uh, what about the reverse? There's stories of American families going over to fight for the Kurds against ISIS. Is that legal? Is it that is. illegal it but is. overlooked? Yeah, so, so what about Americans that are fighting ISIS, the Kurds, the Peshmerga, uh, other groups? They're, they're not a designated terrorist group. The, the U.S. State Department maintains a list of about 45 foreign terrorist organizations. If you're not on that list, you can aid that group that's not on that list. Uh, and not be subject to, to federal prosecution. Are there issues about taking oaths to the particular military group or to another nation that then jeopardizes U.S. citizenship or anything like that? Uh, say that again, please. If you, if you take an oath to a foreign oath, okay. you know, is that an issue? Um, I'm not thinking if you about take... Oscar, I hope we we'll get some ideas here. <laughs> 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 My wife said no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think taking an oath in and of itself uh, does not subject you to, uh, to federal prosecution. Uh, I, I think there needs to be more than just a word. There needs to be some type of action, whether it's giving money, uh, giving training, um, giving support in, in some way. Uh, but an oath by, in and of itself probably doesn't get you over the goal line. I feel like at least in my understanding, a lot of these groups tend to be derivative of one another, these terrorist groups. I'm curious if there's any current strategies or concepts or ways that we can uh, be taking action that prevents derivative groups from arising, because it seems like a lot of the action ends up being short-sighted, or there are things that blindside us and turns out, oh wait, now this happened, and we need to respond to that, and then something else happens. I'm wondering if there's any long view uh, strategies for preventing that kind of thing from continuing perpetually? I'll take a crack at this. This is a great question. And again, going back to my mental test of if you would have told me a week after September 11, 2001, that almost 14 years later, our government still would not have an effective counter-radicalization strategy and policies, I would have also been really disappointed. And I am. Um, and this is a bipartisan failure. Uh, we in the Bush administration, I worked on this quite a bit. We tried and, and we failed. We had some good ideas and some projects. Essentially, counter-radicalization, fancy term for how do we prevent um, young Muslims from not turning into jihadists? Uh, how do we prevent them from uh, you know, signing up for these groups and going from having a more peaceful, moderate version of Islam to wanting to blow themselves up or behead other people, uh, getting, getting radicalized? And there, there's a number of pathways to radicalization. There is uh, some pretty good research that's been done on this. We're starting to understand how it happens, but we still haven't figured out how to stop it. Uh, and the Bush administration tried and largely failed, uh, and the Obama administration has also lar largely failed. And this is one of the things that worries me, and this is one of the things I think that accounts for why we have this proliferation of these different jihadist franchises, uh, and more and more recruits, uh, recruits joining them. 
Um, so there, there, it's not been a complete failure. Uh, there have been you know, some covert programs that can't be talked about that uh, have been effective. There have been some more overt ones. Uh, you know, the Saudis, for all their brutality, have actually uh, had a fairly effective de-radicalization program that's at least worked in some, some cases. Um, so, but, but that's, that's, it, it's called the battle of ideas, essentially. Um, and uh, we're, I worry we're losing the battle of ideas. Um, we do. I have time for one more question. Just to kind of follow up on that, I'm interested to know how much um, in kind of the, um, the preemptive to keep to keep them from recruiting, like how much economics is playing in that as far as the economic opportunities for I don't know, kids my age, 20 to 30 year olds, and because you have the BBC's interviewing mothers t saying their sons are wanting to go to ISIS because they have nothing to do in their homes. Is that uh, something we're giving a lot of consideration to, to try to implement economic? It, it, it is, and, and, it, and in some cases it really is a factor, but I think in some ways it's perhaps been a little overdetermined. I mean, there, about a month ago the State Department spokeswoman made a comment about, well, it's you know, largely lack of jobs explains why these you know, usually young 20-something you know, Muslim men go, go to become terrorists. In some cases, that may be part of it, but the worrisome thing is if you look at the 9-11 hijackers or a lot of the leaders of these groups now, a lot of them are quite well educated, uh, come from middle class or upper middle class backgrounds, and uh, so did not have economic impoverishment, uh, but rather just were, for some other reason, were attracted to this very um, seductive, radical, uh, nihilistic, uh, nihilistic ideology. So it seems to be some combination of a person who has a, a set of grievances, uh, feeling like uh, they're not appreciated, they, uh, maybe they don't have enough opportunity, uh, maybe um, they've had some other uh, difficult circumstances in life, so they've got that set of grievances, and then along comes this appealing ideology that helps them make sense of all that, and uh, feels, feels empowering and helps, uh, you know, helps give them a grid for mapping out the world and a sense of purpose and meaning. And I'm all for people having purpose and meaning in life, especially those who are aggrieved, but this is not uh, a very constructive type of purpose and meaning. So, so again, the simplistic, uh, well, it's just poverty and lack of jobs, and if we just do more international development, then no more terrorists, just, just doesn't work. Yeah, and just quickly, uh, I mean, I think of somebody like Jihadi John, uh, who's British, uh, in Britain. Yeah. Britain. Uh, I think he's equated national, but he but he's a legal resident of, of the UK. You know, he his parents are upper middle class, was educated, he had opportunity, but he rejected that, and he's he's a vicious killer uh, who needs to be brought to justice uh, or blown up by a drone strike, uh, in my humble view. <laughs> um, but so I, I, I want to echo what, what Will says, uh, you know, uh, you can't just say it's just a matter of education. That, that's, that's way too simple. Uh, although I, I did notice when I was with the commissions that I noticed that a lot of the, the suicide bombers were from the lower rungs uh, and the ones that sent the suicide bombers on the missions <coughs> tended to be the more upper middle class, more educated. So, yeah. Um, that, that's, that's what I would say. Great. All right. Well, that's uh, that's going to have to sort of uh, do it for us. We're, uh, we're just about out of time. Um, tonight, again, 7 o'clock, right here, uh, Dr. Ian Bowden will be delivering this spring's Tiffany Lecture on the Middle East four, uh, four conflicts and, and the challenges of Christian state, statesmanship. Um, so if uh, please return, bring your friends, your foes, your uh, acquaintances. We'd love to see you. Uh, but please let, uh, join me in giving our, our two uh, conversations.